Hi, David uh, and everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to, to give this talk. And I still remember very fondly my last visit to Paris. And uh, I see uh, that you have a camera in the, in the room where, I, where we met last time. So, but it's still great that we could meet uh, online, even if not in person. And thank you for putting uh, Puccini as, as uh, the opening music. That, that's, that was great. Thanks a lot. Um, so, yeah, so um, uh, let me share my screen and uh, uh, let's see. I hope everybody can see my screen. Yes, yeah. so I'll start the presentation. And um, uh, yeah, so as David mentioned, I, I recently started my lab um, at University of Oregon uh, in Eugene. This is on the, on the US uh, West Coast. Uh, we're on the Pacific Coast. And so it's, it's 8 a.m. here. Um, and I, I want to, to uh, share with you today some of the first uh, directions of, uh, of research of my lab and um, University of Oregon, in particular, um, the emergent modulation of time and timing related uh, uh, dynamics uh, in, in neural circuits. Uh, and uh, before I move on, I want to acknowledge um, the amazing uh, team uh, and uh, that I've been very, very lucky to collaborate with uh, and blessed with uh, talking to them every day now on, on Zoom or, or Slack. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is mainly, uh, so there's going to be three parts of the talk. The, the first part of the talk has been uh, has been uh, 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 now posted on the archive. It's a paper by Stefano Recanatesi, who's a postdoc, uh, and um, Ulises uh, Pereira, who's a postdoc at NYU. So uh, they're going to be both on the job market soon. So if you like this story, please remember them. And this is based on a collaboration with uh, an experimental group at Champollion, um, led by Zach Mainen. And I'm going to talk about an experiment uh, done by Masa Murakami. And I'm going to include ideas from uh, Fanny Kazep. And uh, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about some work that's been done by David Weirich, who's a graduate student in my lab. Um, so in fact, I realized that um, everybody in my lab is, um, is, a, is a former recovering physicist, <laughs> just like me, I guess. So in the last part of the talk, I hope I'll get to, to, to briefly talk about that at the end, is, is some amazing recent uh, development that have been uh, 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 lucky to, to work on with uh, Nico Istrade, who's a student in my lab, and Merab Stern, um, who you might know. Um, and, so, and so this is also related to discussions with uh, Gianluigi Mongillo and Giancarlo La Camera and Ali Reza, who recently joined the lab. So, so these are the people who did the work. And so let me start with some motivation uh, for what we do in the lab. So in the lab, our experimental colleagues, they work with mice, uh, but we don't have a la uh, like an like, um, animal lab. So uh, we just infer our, uh, our theories from watching YouTube videos. This is my favorite one. And so what we look at, um, we look at spontaneous uh, animal behavior, uh, self-initiated animal behavior. And as you can see in this video, I hope you can see, um, there's a mouse that's uh, trying to get a walnut into their cave. Um, and what they do is that they perform a very complex sequence of, uh, of um, you know, natural behavior. And I'm going to try to tease you uh, about uh, how we think about this. So we think about this behavior as being, um, as being uh, 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 decomposed at different timescales. So the fastest part of the behavior that we, uh, we think about as syllables, as a language. Um, so are these actions that the animal, uh, the mouse is taking? So at the 100 millisecond scale, and these are like whisking, uh, sniffing the walnut, moving a paw to reach to the walnut. And so these are like very fast self-initiated actions. Um, on the other hand, these actions uh, compose into uh, sequences of actions, uh, some kind of words uh, in this language of behavior that are on a longer time scale of a second or a few seconds. And this is like composing these small, these small movements into walking, rolling the walnut, hiding it back into the hole, and so on and so forth. And then there's a, there's a, a third time scale in behavior that arises at a much longer um, uh, uh, time span, which is uh, the idea of using these words, these meaningful sequences of actions to compose sentences or like behavioral plans or strategies that the animal are, is carrying out 
uh, as goal directed in this case. Um, and so we turn on the minute long or several minute long time scale. And in this case, this is the overarching goal the animal has, which is uh, let's get the walnut into the, the cave, even if, of course, you see it doesn't work, but it keep, they keep trying over and over again. So, so there's these three time scales, at least in behavior, just by watching YouTube videos. Uh, you know, we also watch videos of beavers, of dogs, or bears, or many other animals. And you can see that it's, it's very similar in all, in all animals. And the idea is that we, we think that this kind of uh, structure of time scale of behavior um, uh, might be uh, generated um, by some structure neural activity, some neural mechanism in the brain that generates all these different time scales. And so the goal of our investigation is to understand this, uh, how these, these time scales arise and are modulated um, by brain mechanisms. And so in the, in the first part of the talk, I'm gonna, uh, uh, I'm gonna um, discuss some ideas about how actions are represented in brain circuits and how, we, uh, how the brain is composing actions into meaningful sequences uh, from the few hundred milliseconds to the few second scale. So this is gonna be the first part of the talk. So we're gonna talk about representations on act of action and transitions between actions to create sequences. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to uh, stay at this time scale of a second or a few hundred milliseconds and discuss some ideas related to uh, how brains can modulate um, these uh, transitions between actions or, or attractors, or, as we're going to see, uh, in a flexible way to adapt to different states or behavioral demands. So, so modulation of time. And in the third part of the talk, which I hope I'm going to get to talk at the end, so I'm going to discuss how several different time scales can arise in the same circuit at the same time simultaneously. So what's the simplest possible neural mechanism um, that generates this hierarchy of time scales at different orders of magnitude? So, so this is the plan of the talk. And um, I'm going to dive right in into the first part which is to understand how uh, uh, the structure of spontaneous behavior arises from neural circuits at a second long time scale. And the strong motivation for this work comes from this amazing uh, series of paper by the Bob Data Lab um, at Harvard that, uh, that I'm, I'm mentioning here on this slide, and where they analyze the spontaneous behavior of, of mice for hours uh, using sophisticated uh, video, video uh, analysis. And the way they analyze this is that they um, segmented the spontaneous behavior of a mouse into behavioral syllables. And what I'm showing you here uh, on top, I hope you can see my cursor, um, is a sequence uh, of, uh, of behavioral syllables uh, during some, uh, some spontaneous, uh, like a few seconds of spontaneous behavior. And you see, there are several sources. Is there a question? No. Ah, there are several sources of variability um, arising into this picture. And so, for example, you can see that uh, there are many, many actions the animal can take at any given time. So the, you can see the rear pause, the dive, the locomotion. Every action is uh, in a different color here. Uh, not only that, but we can combine all of these actions into a combinatorically large number of sequences, right? So, so um, uh, as for example, you can see here, Every time you have a blue action um, and you transition to a different action, um, it can be uh, any of those. So it can be a green action, it can be a, a red action. So, so there's a combinatorically large uh, possibility in this kind of spatial variability or lexical variability in behavior. And the other thing that I'm going to um, uh, focus on here is that not only is there this lexical variability in behavior, but every time the animal is um, performing one particular action, let's say the blue action here, the dive, they, uh, uh, they do it at a different time. So, uh, so every time you have a dive, um, it can last uh, from 500 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. So there's a huge source of temporal variability in this self-initiated behavior. And so this like sounds like an insurmountable problem, like a formidable problem to solve. And so uh, because of our limited capacities, uh, what we thought about doing was that um, we thought about controlling for the lexical variability in behavior and actually focusing 
uh, only on the temporal variability for the moment. And so we were, uh, so we came up with this uh, experiment that that control uh, 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 for a fixed set of actions or syllables that the animal uh, can make, but still in a fixed order, such that though they're all self-initiated. So we preserve this very large temporal variability. And so and, uh, hopefully I'll convince you that, that we could, using this method, we can uh, at least start to crack the problem. And, and this is the, the, the work that's on the bioarchive that you can see, it's under revision now, and it's been led by Stefano and Ulysses uh, using uh, an experimental collaboration uh, with Zach Mainen and uh, Mazen Murakami and Champalimo. So I'm gonna just mention some of the highlights of this work. And if you wanna know, there's much, much more going in details going into this. And so you're very welcome to, um, to look at our paper or ask me later for, for more details. So this is the structure of the task. In the task, um, um, a freely moving uh, uh, rodent in, um, in a cage um, uh, is going to poke in uh, into a waiting port to initiate the trials uh, spontaneously whenever they want. And then as soon as they poke in, they are, uh, um, there's a, a first stone that's on that signals the beginning of the trial. And then the animal has to wait for a second tone to appear at a random time uh, later. Uh, and after they hear the second tone, they can poke out and poke into a water port if they like and get some water delivery, uh, some reward. This is called a patient trial because they wait. However, there's another option available uh, to the animal at, uh, in, a, in every trial, which is the animal doesn't have to wait for the second tone. They can just poke out whenever they like uh, regardless, and then uh, uh, go to the water port and collect the reward. Uh, and so they collect a small reward if they're impatient or a large reward if they're patient. So some of you uh, who are familiar with the psychology literature might have recognized that this is um, the uh, rodent version of the marshmallow experiment, the famous uh, experiment where a kid is um, left alone in a room with a marshmallow. Uh, so, so Maza and, uh, and Zach were like created this amazing paradigm that, that we are, uh, we're studying now. So there's one fixed set of action in every trial, regardless of the condition, because the actions are always the same, uh, in a fixed order that the animal has to go through to collect the reward. But the crucial issue is that all of the actions are self-initiated. So the animal, um, can do that whenever they like. So... And to give you an idea uh, of the very the temporal variability in this task, um, for example, I'm, I'm, uh, let's let's focus on the wait time, on the waiting time. And so, what I'm showing you here on the left is every vertical line is the trial, and the black bar, which is either full or dashed for patient and impatient trials, uh, represents the waiting time in that particular trial. So. You see that there's a there's a humongous variability, uh, temporal variability in this trial, even though the animal is performing always the same action. So this is what we we're going to focus on. And so the question we ask are, how does the brain represent all these actions the animal is taking? How the animal, uh, uh, how does the brain generate this action sequence, concatenating uh, actions uh, in a meaningful way? And how does this huge variability in timing arise um, from neural circuits. So these are the three questions we're going to focus on. And to answer these questions, uh, Maz and Zach recorded from the secondary motor cortex of, of the rat, uh, uh, So the, uh, which is, uh, this is just a, a cartoon uh, because I don't know much anatomy, but this is the LNCCF. And we, I, I put a circle where I think uh, more or less the secondary motor cortex is in the front of the brain. And so Maz recorded uh, simultaneous, uh, the simultaneous activity of several ensemble neurons around uh, this, this recording electrodes. And what I'm showing you here, and I'm going to show you a bunch of those, this is a raster plot of 12 simultaneously recorded neurons uh, from the secondary motor cortex during this task. So every line, every line you see here um, uh, is a neuron, and you see we have from 1 to 12. Every vertical bar is an action potential or spike emitted by that neuron uh, at a particular time. And uh, I show you three trials uh, during this, uh, this test. And because the actions are self-initiated, I added a arrow, a small colored arrow on top of the raster plot when the action was performed. So we have poking, 
this is the time of the first stone, um, uh, the poke out, then the water poking, and when the animal collects the reward. And you see they occur at different times in different trials. So, so now if you squint and if you kind of really uh, look at uh, many, many raster plots, you start to hallucinate that there's some spatial temporal pattern of, uh, of activity in this population uh, raster plots. Uh, I highlighted one in red here. And for example, this is another uh, spatial temporal pattern of activity. Uh, what is a spatial temporal pattern of activity? We assume that the underlying model is that there is some intervals during this trial where neurons fire at a constant rate uh, transiently. And then they change firing rate. And so I highlighted two, uh, two periods by hand where we see that one neuron fires a lot, two neurons fires a lot here, you see. And then in this gray, in this gray box, uh, neuron 11 and 12 fire a lot, and the others are, are more or less silent. So we use the, this uh, a standard technique to extract these uh, patterns, these sequences of patterns of activity, which is called a hidden Markov model. It's a Poisson hidden Markov model. And what I show you here is the result of the fit. So there's a lot going on under the hood here, which I'm not mentioning, all these kind of model fitting issues. Uh, if you want to know more, you're very welcome to look at our papers, supplementary figures. And so the hidden Marco model is extracting or segmenting in an unsupervised way this raster plot into periods of uh, constant firing rate, population uh, uh, vector. So uh, during these periods, the neurons uh, uh, fire with uh, uh, with a constant firing rate uh, with, as a Poisson processes. And so you see that we have several patterns and there's two issues here is that, first of all, there's many patterns in each trial. Uh, and these are the different color codes where the posterior probability of these, uh, of these um, patterns is very high. And the, we have the same patterns in all trials. First, uh, first uh, item, second item, uh, the patterns have a very different duration in different trials. So there's a lot of temporal variability across trials in these patterns. So what we do now is that we looked at um, all trials in this particular session, and we found ways to, to visualize this so that we can start to generate hypotheses. And so for example, these are the three trials I showed you before. And now on the right, you see all the trials, the correct trials uh, where the animal is performing this action uh, in this particular uh, session. And you see that there's some kind of temporal variability associated with this, uh, where we align the trials to the poking, but the other actions are, are occurring at random time. To visualize this, what we did is that we stretched the trials so that we, uh, we, we could overlay them on top of each other. And so in this particular representation, uh, the time is stretched. Uh, and so we align the poking, poke out, and water poking so that you could see the sequences one on top of each other. So every line here, again, is one particular trial. And the color code is the interval from the, from the hidden Marco model fit on the left uh, side, you see. So every line here is a representation of one of the trials here. And you see that there's a very consistent structure of uh, uh, sequences of patterns um, in, um, in secondary motor cortex. Uh, in, all, in all correct trials. And so this is not an accident of our favorite session, even this is our favorite session, uh, because if we look at many, many sessions and many, many animals, uh, this is, uh, we find the exact same structure in all of them. So uh, secondary motor cortex uh, can be described, uh, its activity can be captured very, very well by these sequences of states uh, that we interpret as attractors. So what is uh, the temporal uh, um, characteristic of this, of this state? Um, is there, there very large variability in the duration of these sequences? And this is the exponential distribution of, the, uh, of, these, uh, of these durations, which, is, uh, which has an average of uh, 500 milliseconds. Uh, in this particular animal. And, um, and so it's kind of an exponential dwell time distribution. So this suggests that there might be some kind of stochastic mechanism driving uh, the transitions uh, between the attractors that we we'll get to um, in, in a couple of minutes. So before we go there, um, uh, I wanna ask the following question. So we, we have these sequences of attractors in, in secondary motor cortex. And the question is, um, do they encode any behaviorally relevant information? So what, does the, what do these uh, attractors or this state uh, encode? 
And so the way we went about to, to study this was that we trained the dictionary between attractors and the self-initiated actions that uh, the animal was performing. And we train a dictionary between attractor onset and action in correct trials. So these are the trials where the animal was performing this correct sequence of actions that I highlighted um, uh, before, uh, poking in, waiting, poking out, poking into the water poke and getting the reward. So these I call correct trials. So we can train a cross-validated dictionary uh, uh, that um, uh, such uh, to identify the attractors whose onset is predicting uh, the next action. For example, uh, you see the poke out here. So there's consistently in every trial, there's a state, this red state, whose onset always consistently precedes the poke out. And for the water poking, for example, this is, for, uh, this is uh, occurring with the purple state. From the poking, this is occurring for this, uh, um, for this yellow state and so on. So there are some states that uh, consistently, pre uh, whose onset consistently precedes these actions. So we use the uh, a, a dictionary trained on the correct trials, and then we predict the actions in the error trials. These are many, many trials during the session where the animal is just not performing the task that, that they learned. Uh, the animal is performing, uh, however, uh, other weird series of actions. We want to use this dictionary trained on correct trials to predict the actions in error trials. And this is a cross-validated uh, confusion matrix of the prediction of these, uh, of these three actions, poking, poke out, and water poking, from the onset of the attractors. And you see that it's perfect in correct trial, and it's very, very good also in error trials. So we claim that the onset of these attractors predict the upcoming actions. So, okay, so now we have, um, uh, we have uh, to summarize what we found so far, the analysis of, of the neural data from secondary motor cortex, we have reliable sequences of attractors uh, whose onset predict uh, behavior. And uh, the crucial uh, quantities that I'm gonna focus on now uh, for the next few slides is that the large variability in these, uh, in these transition times which mirrors the large variability uh, in these intervals between different actions, for example, the waiting time. So we want to um, uh, study what the simplest uh, neural circuit would be that could generate reliable sequences of attractors whose transition times have this huge variability in time. So, so this is our goal now. So we want to have a model that explains how this could arise from some, from some neural mechanism. And and the way we go about to look at this is we use um, recurrent neural networks. And so uh, what do we mean by recurrent neural network? Um, so these are uh, uh, recurrent network or, or rate units. And this is the equation that describes the dynamics of the network. This is a very familiar uh, equation for, for most of you. I hope so. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. So the idea is that uh, we have some variables ui that describe the activity of each of these neurons. And uh, uh, so there's recurrent connectivity in the network, uh, which is represented by this J. Uh, this is the synaptic coupling uh, matrix, JIJ. And so what you are probably familiar with is the usual uh, Hopfield network. Uh, a Hopfield network is a network where um, there's a number of attractors of stable state uh, baked into the synaptic uh, couplings. And so in particular, when the synaptic couplings are, are, uh, um, are, have this uh, Hebbian structure, uh, they can store uh, the attractors psi, uh, psi mu. So we can store P attractors in the network. And the way this, this works is that on the left, you see this kind of uh, temporal dynamics of, of, this, um, of three representative units from this network. They start from random initial condition, and then they, they quickly uh, converge onto a stable attractor, which is described by this vector of fine rate psi mu. So this is kind of the idea of the, the general framework for our model. It's a, a standard attractor networks, except that in this particular network, the Hopfield uh, case, uh, attractors are stable. And so this is not going to work for us because we have sequences of attractors. So, so we looked in the literature and we found uh, some classic models generating sequences of attractors. So from, uh, from uh, uh, Kantor and Sompolisky and Kleinfeld and others from the 80s. And so, how do you do how you do that is that you 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 have a model where you have two synaptic couplings 
Uh, the first one is the usual half field term that that sets this um, the this this um, uh, the location of the attractors with these bilinears in in these vectors, and the second term is uh, what we call a fit forward term that generates a sequence concatenating consecutive attractors in the sequence same mu with same mu plus one. So this is like the classic model, and so what we did is we studied the phase space of this model as a function of these two, the symmetric part of the connectivity and the anti-symmetric part of the connectivity, and of course, you find three basic uh, um, uh, uh, regimes in these dynamics. Uh, for a small value of the couplings, there's nothing going on, the network just uh, stays at zero, so there's no attractors. Uh, for large values of the symmetric part, the hot field part, the Hebbian part of the couplings, you have stable attractors. This is what I showed you before. Uh, what I'm showing you here, uh, this uh, on the right is the overlap between the network activity and each attractor, right? And there's uh, another regime where the fit four part is large, where you actually generate sequences of, of attractors. Uh, however, there's a problem with the sequences of attractors, um, and that because there's no variability in this model, the sequences of attractors here um, has have very fixed, uh, very stereotyped temporal uh, dynamics, meaning that the attractors all, all, always last the same amount of time. So what we did is that we started from this um, uh, this uh, phase in the model, and we thought, well, we can just add some private noise. If we drive the network with noise, we are certainly going to uh, uh, get uh, a variability in timing. But in fact, it turns out this is not true. And what we found is that um, in the network with some private noise, uh, you introduce, this is like on the, on the left, you see the sequence of overlaps with the different attractors. On the right, you see uh, the average, so the distribution of durations of each, of each attractors. You see that uh, this is not true. So we don't generate this huge exponential uh, distribution of, of transition times. Uh, we just uh, generate a little jitter. And if we push the analysis a little further, you find that with private noise, there's no region of parameters where this works. With low noise, you have a little jitter in a sequence. With high noise, you just completely destroy the, uh, the sequence. So, so this model doesn't work. We were very surprised to find that the model doesn't work because we thought it would. And then by thinking a little bit about it, we figured out why the model doesn't work. And then we got the crucial insight to, to, to actually uh, find a, a, a model that works. So, so the idea is the following. Uh, let's um, uh, let's uh, have a cartoon of these attractors in kind of the space of, uh, of fine rates. And so I'm, I'm, I'm here having a cartoon of an energy landscape, if you, if you want to think about this uh, in the hot field sense. So where attractors are just potential wells uh, in this energy landscape. So I, I just uh, have three attractors here that you can see. And so the idea is that we want to generate transitions from one well to the next well, um, but this transition has to be in a very particular direction because we want to generate a reliable sequence, uh, always the same transition in, in all trials or, or very uh, or uh, predominantly the same transition in all trials. And what we're trying to do this uh, here with the private noise is that we want to generate this transition by using random fluctuations. And so this is never going to work because your intuition about two dimensional uh, uh, energy landscape completely fails when you are in a very high dimensional space of neurons. Here we have, I don't know, we're simulating network 10,000 neurons. So this picture is extremely misleading. There's no chance that by fluctuating in random directions, you're going to find the right, that one particular direction to generate your sequence. And so the way to, and so this is of course the course of dimensionality in, uh, in this very high dimensional um, rate networks. So the crucial intuition here is that you can definitely achieve a stochastic transition, but if your fluctuations are, are constrained on a very low dimensional space uh, and they fluctuate in the direction of the next uh, attractor. And so we replaced the, then this private noise term here with, with a single uh, noise variable that's multiplicating, the, that's multiplicative of the fit forward term in the, in the network. So this generates very low dimensional uh, correlated noise that drives the network into the next, next attractor. But because it, the transitions are noise, noise driven, they're going to retain this huge uh, variability. And when we simulate the model, this is a model simulation, we find that it's exactly like, it looks exactly like the, the data. And so we qu can quantify this in the, in the paper. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. And, and we find this exponential distribution of dwell times 
uh, or the duration of these attractors. So, so the model works. Not only does the model work, uh, it reproduces beautifully these raster plots that we see um, in the data. And uh, because we have a, this very specific structure uh, of fluctuations, which are proportional to this fit for term in the model, uh, the model uh, now generates two very specific predictions. So if we consider noise correlations, so what are noise correlations in this model? Noise correlations are going to be the correlations that are conditional on the attractor. So we have these temporal dynamics. We, uh, we segment the activity around uh, uh, with uh, when it's dwelling around one attractor, and we calculate the, the noise correlations around this particular attractor. So they're low dimensional because this term is row dimensional. It has rank P and it's, and it's uh, much, much smaller than N, right? And they are highly aligned because of the, of the fit forward structure of this term. They are highly aligned in, direction, in the direction of the next attractor. So these are very clear predictions of the model. And so what we did is that we went back to the data and we tested this prediction. And what I'm gonna show you here is the result of this data analysis where we, focus now around one particular attractor, let's say the, the red one, uh, for example, here in the model and in the data. And we're gonna look at the uh, covariance matrix, the noise correlation conditioned on this particular interval in time, this attractor. This is what it looks like in the data in PC space. Every uh, dot here is one uh, fine rate vector for uh, one attractor in one trial. And so you see, oh, this is kind of the, the, uh, the, the color coded map. And for two attractors, we have the red attractor and the gray attractor here. Uh, what we do is we look at the angle between the noise correlation. This cloud is the noise correlation for the red state. This, this, cloud, this gray cloud is the noise correlation for the gray state. And so using canonical correlation analysis, I'm going to skip all of the details. We can look at the angle between these two clouds of, of, um, of points in PC, in PC space. And what we find, in fact, is that uh, as we step away from one network to, uh, so, sorry, from one attractor to the next one, to, two away, to uh, three away in the sequence, four away in the sequence, six away in the sequence, this alignment between the noise correlations, this canonical correlation between noise correlations uh, drops both in the model and in the data. And so, and so this was kind of very surprising when we looked uh, at the data and we we're like, so this might be an indication that this low dimensional correlated variability is actually um, at play in the secondary motor cortex. So let me summarize this uh, part of the talk. So we have um, uh, a theory for how we represent upcoming actions in secondary motor cortex as metastable attractors that, that concatenate into sequences. And so how do we generate these transitions that are reliable, but with very large, large variability in time? Uh, and we propose this model in terms of a low dimensional correlated variability. And so we also have a version of the model which is biologically plausible and entails like a, 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 a circuit involved in secondary motor cortex and a subcortical area. So I'm not gonna talk about that, but there, it, it, it's possible to cast this uh, effective model that I show you, this rate network into a, a biologically plausible model. Uh, so you can ask me later more about that if you're interested. And so the question is like, why do we have this timing variability in our brain? So, uh, and so I'm gonna propose a, kind of a, a potential uh, uh, reason why this is useful. So imagine when we have to perform this super complex action sequences that has to have, they have to have perfect timing when the bear is catching the, the salmon going upstream. You know, this is what happens here outside of our house because we're in Oregon. So <laughs> there's bears and salmon. Um, so uh, they, these bears have perfect timing, but you know, they had to learn how to get to the perfect timing. And on the right, you can see that, you know, the animal knows the sequence of action they have to perform, but they don't know the exact timing and they need to learn that. So this mechanism might be related um, to a way to explore for optimal timing when you know the sequence of action, but you don't know how to, uh, to actually uh, uh, obtain it um, uh, to, to perform your goal. So this is a possible explanation or, or usefulness of this timing variability. So, okay, so, so far, uh, what I showed you is that um, uh, we, we have a, a way to generate action sequences 
However, um, uh, it, uh, many times, uh, one, even if you know this action sequence, you want to be able to, uh, um, to flexibly control the speed at which you perform some action or the speed of these transition times uh, according to, to, to adapt to different contexts or, or different goals. You want to have, uh, be, you want to be able to perform these sequences faster if it's required to be fast or uh, slower if you're distracted, for example. So what is the mechanism uh, to control the speed, the processing speed of this neural circuit? And so what we do is that we go back, let's go back to this picture that we have in terms of potential wells. That's kind of, um, even if it's slightly misleading, it's still useful to think about that, uh, uh, to draw, to draw um, uh, hypothesis. So, so the transition time uh, between these attractors in the diffusion process depends on the height between the, uh, or the height of the barrier separating these two attractors. For example, here on the left, I have a projection on this direction from A to B. This is like two potential wells with some height of the barrier, right? So that's the transition time. And, you know, there might be a different condition in which uh, um, I have a different height of the barrier between the same attractors and changing the height of the barrier leads to a, a different transition time. Uh, so for example, lower barriers mean faster transition times. And so um, using mean field theory, uh, and some ideas that were developed also by uh, Maurizio Mattia and uh, Daniel Amit uh, in the past. Uh, there is a way to uh, show that this picture of potential well is equivalent to a picture in which um, the height of the barrier is determined by the gain of the single neuron transfer function. So what I'm showing you here at the bottom is the input output transfer function of a neuron in the mean field, uh, in the mean field picture. And uh, the potential uh, is given by the integral of this transfer function. So the height of the barrier is determined by the gain of this transfer function. So a steep gain leads to a high barrier and a kind of a sloppy, uh, so not sloppy, uh, um, a mild gain leads to a lower uh, barrier. So now we have a different picture in which slow and fast transition times are related to high and low gain. So we propose this gain modulation as a, as a mechanism to, to determine, to adjust, flexibly adjust this transition time. And so this picture of the gain is very convenient because it's experimentally testable. And so um, uh, while, you know, we never observe uh, 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 energy landscapes, uh, right? So, but we can definitely measure uh, uh, transition functions, uh, input output functions. And so, so the way we went about to test this is that we interpreted this, uh, this system in which is a, each attractor represents uh, a state of, of a network of a neural circuit in which, for example, attractor A is the baseline and attractor B is the representation of a stimulus, of the stimulus, stimulus response to the network. And then the hypothesis here is that uh, if you want to have a condition with faster stimulus coding, where the network responds faster to incoming stimulus, encodes this, uh, information about the stimulus faster, then this prediction of this model is that the neural mechanism underlying it um, uh, should be a lower gain uh, as a single neural level. And what uh, David Weirich, a student in my lab, um, did is like he tested this hypothesis using this amazing open source data set um, uh, from the Allen Institute in Seattle. So this is the Allen NeuroPixel data set uh, where they record activity simultaneously for, from the whole visual hierarchy. These are, this is like here, this is the cartoon of the visual hierarchy, V1, LM, PM, all these other uh, higher visual areas. And so, so we have a mouse uh, that's sitting in darkness sometimes or is presented visual stimuli drifting gradient in, some, in different conditions. And we can measure the, the properties of the, neural, uh, of the neural activity in this, uh, in this experiment. And in particular, we're gonna measure um, the following, we're gonna test the following hypothesis that running, uh, the animal is on a ball, so it, it can either sit or run. And we're gonna test the hypothesis that running is lowering the gain. So running, if running lowers the gain, uh, then the prediction is that running is gonna change the speed of visual coding and it's gonna uh, increase the speed of visual coding. So we're gonna first measure the changing gain uh, during, during darkness. 
So we're not visual stimuli and we're gonna formulate our, our, our hypothesis using this. And then uh, we're gonna go to the evoked condition and look at the, at the changing stimulus coding. So, so David uh, estimated the changing gain during darkness, and he found that in all visual areas, so these are the five visual areas in the Allen NeuroPixel data set, we find a significant decrease in gain at the level of, of this uh, transfer function um, during running compared to rest. So there's a decrease in gain in all areas. And then this predicts now using our theory um, that there's gonna be an acceleration of stimulus coding, and in fact, uh, now we have, we go to the other condition where the animal was presented is drifting gradings, two different orientation, vertical or horizontal. We can do a decoding analysis to look at the time course here on the horizontal axis of the stimulus coding in the population um, activity in the spike uh, populations, in the population spikes. And on the y-axis, I show you the decoding accuracy of decoding the stimuli. And you see that during rest, there's some kind of you know, a latency of coding and then some, uh, some, uh, some uh, rise, uh, some speed at which the, the, the information is encoded. And during running, this is faster than during resting. So in fact, we, in all visual area, the difference, this, uh, this yellow uh, uh, shaded area here, which is the, the acceleration of uh, stimulus coding during running, um, is, significant, is significant, it's about um, 20 milliseconds on, on average. So, so this is, was kind of very, uh, uh, a very cool result that we thought, okay, so maybe our theory uh, kind of makes sense. Uh, at least it's not obviously wrong. So uh, again, running is this kind of mo uh, modulation of, um, of brain activity that uh, lowers the gain uh, during darkness in the absence of stimuli and predicts this acceleration of coding. And what we found here, this is a bioarchive paper. You can, it, there's much more in the paper. This is just, you know, the cartoonish version of what we did. Um, so this confirms this uh, mechanism that we, we proposed uh, uh, in a paper we published last year uh, in the gustatory cortex with the group at Stony Brook, um, where we found an acceleration of coding due to expectation. So. And um, uh, I want to mention that now we want to propose this state-dependent game modulation as a general mechanism for controlling timing um, uh, in attractor networks and in, and in cortex. And uh, we paired up with, um, with, uh, with an artist at the University of Oregon with a comics uh, studies program. And uh, we wrote a nice graphic, mo uh, graphic novel on your modulation that's on my website uh, if you want to if you want to go there and look it up, it, it's it's kind of it's kind of pretty cool. Um, and so we want to explain neuromodulation. Um, and now we're testing this with many different experiments to test this mechanism in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, game modulation. So, um, do I still have a few minutes, or is it are we over time? Um, is that okay if I take three or four more minutes? Yeah, I see you have another let's say seven minutes. So means, okay, this is great. So I'm gonna have time to mention our last, uh, the last part of the uh, of this collaboration. So, uh, so far, then I mentioned how we can uh, represent actions and concatenate them into sequences um, to explain self-initiated behavior. How we can flexibly control using game modulation the timing of these sequences. But then I started from this kind of um, bird's eye view of behavior, of spontaneous behavior, in which we have these multiple timescales occurring in the same um, in the same uh, uh, in the same behavior, uh, from the hundred millisecond to the second to the minute long timescale. And so uh, a question that we that we're asking, that we're investigating, and this is work done by Marav Stern and uh, Nico Estrada. And you see up, up here in, uh, on the right. So um, is how, do, how does this hierarchy of time scale arise in a neural circuit? What's the simplest neural circuit that can generate this hierarchy of scale? So what do I mean by this? And so, um, so the idea is that um, uh, we can measure uh, autocorrelation, uh, single neuron autocorrelation times. Um, uh, and so this is an example of a single neuron autocorrelation time, and we can ca uh, capture the time scale of single neurons as the width of these autocorrelations, if you want. And there's been a, a number of papers that show that the distribution of autocorrelation times across neurons um, 
is log normal. So there's a, there's a large variety of time scales in the same circuit. So this is, for example, in, to, in the anterior singular cortex, you find this huge uh, uh, variety of autocorrelation time. So how does this arise from a neural circuit? So, so to answer this question, we went back to um, our rate networks, and we interpreted now uh, the rate network in the following way. Uh, here in the top right, you see this is like um, uh, an image of like a cortical area where every, every uh, circle is a neuron and you see there's like functional assemblies of neurons in the brain. So we interpret every unit in the rate network in the mean field sense as a functional assembly of neurons. And we study the dynamics of these coupled functional assemblies, right? And so we can still represent them as rate networks. And now we introduce a new parameter in the rate network, which is a self-coupling of, uh, of every unit. And that's corresponding to the size of this cortical assembly, if you want. So in this network, all the cortical assemblies have the same size. So we can this is a network that was studied by Merav and Larry and, and Heim. So this is like has a chaotic activity, this transition to chaos. So, so it's kind of a nice temporal dynamics. We can look at this particular um, uh, 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 this particular regime uh, with chaotic dynamics and where the diagonal of the connectivity matrix is the self-coupling. They all have the same self-coupling, right? We can calculate the autocorrelation time of this network. And what we find is that this is the histogram here of the autocorrelation times across all neurons. All neurons have the same uh, autocorrelation time. So this network and this vanilla RNN, they don't uh, show this, uh, this, very, this, uh, this heterogeneity in autocorrelation time. So this doesn't work. So what's the simplest way to modify this network to make it work? And so what we did is that we thought, well, let's go back to biology. And in biology, this assumption that neural assemblies are all the same size, that's, that's clearly not, not correct because there's functional assemblies of many different sizes. So we relax this constraint now and we allow the self-couplings to have different values. In particular, we can study a simple case where we have half of the neurons have a very large self-coupling and half of the neurons have a very small self-coupling. And when you do that, in fact, what you find is that the two populations now have a very different autocorrelation times. These are the two autocorrelations for the large and, and, uh, and uh, large self-coupling and small self-coupling population. And they separate, uh, their autocorrelation times clearly separate. And in fact, they diverge as a function of the difference in the self-coupling, which is the size of this cortical assembly. So we propose this as the simplest possible way to generate this heterogeneity of, um, of, uh, of autocorrelation times. That, so of course, this is like, you know, just a teaser. There's a whole dynamic mean field theory behind this that we're not, I'm not talking about and we're writing a paper. Hopefully we're gonna post it soon. Uh, we, we propose this has a, a, mechan a simple mechanism, biologically motivated, to generate these multiple time scales. So, okay, so this is the end of the talk. <clears throat> Let me summarize. Yes, go ahead. Are you something? Can you go back? Yes. Yeah, so in the tunch, it's the index is, is J or it's I? Ah, uh, sorry, there's a typo. No, it's a I. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh my God. Yeah, that's a, crucial. Thank you for bringing this up. This is an UI because it's the self coupling, right? So uh, that's very embarrassing. Thank you. So, <laughs> defeats the whole purpose. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes. So cool. <laughs> thank you for bringing that up. So let me summarize what we found. So we are proposing a theory for the emergent and modulation of time in neural circuits. And so we show you how we can interpret the secondary motor cortex as an attractor network where attractors are metastable. And that explains the variability in self-initiated actions. Uh, transitions are generated by this low dimensional correlated variability uh, that, that we described um, in the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk, we show how a potential mechanism to uh, modulate flexibly this time of action. And in the last part of the talk, I gave you kind of a teaser on how one can generate this hierarchy of time scales from a very simple mechanism, just different uh, size of cell assemblies. Um, and uh, so these are the people who, who did the work. Again, Stefano and Ulysses uh, in collaboration with Zach and Maza for the first part of the talk, David for the second part of the talk, and Merav and Nico for the last part of the talk. And of course, uh, uh, this idea of, of multiple time scales as a reason for, as a reason for, for many discussions with Gianluigi, Mongillo, and Giancarlo Camera that you also know that I'd like to acknowledge. 
and uh, that's it. This is the end of the talk. Uh, thank you so much for for uh, for this opportunity.